these are six points that I think are factors that affect the vulnerability of minors to pornography. I'm going to focus on number one, though, in the interest of time today, and that is that pornography is the most common teaching, learning, sexual experience for youth. It informs and sets sexual templates and scripts, and it has become the de facto primary sex education vehicle. The other ones, such as frontal lobe uh, development, the pruning myelination issue, a mental health uh, coercion, teaching males to coerce females, teaching females to submit to coercion, eroding empathy, uh, like the tobacco industry, it's a cabal that depends on addicting and branding consumers at younger ages, and then the international public health effort. We'll address that some at the end. So just briefly, uh, in terms of we're going to talk about learning today and how learning is important in a negative way for young people who are exposed to pornography. Our son, when he was four years old, my wife was really interested with that all of our five children learn to have uh, broad, uh, ta drop broad palates. And, and so she was determined that he would learn to like goat cheese. And uh, I don't think any of his siblings will ever forget the day that she, you have to eat this. I don't want to eat it, mommy. And anyway, okay, so he did. And it did not did not work. Uh, and and yet today, he's uh, almost 40. He's a professional. He loves goat cheese. Yet, he literally couldn't keep it down when he was four years old. So it wasn't a natural like for him to like goat cheese. So what happened there? Perceptual psychology is about perceptual learning, how we perceive things. Now, it's not just intuitively, we think, well, we're inherently perceptual. That is true about some things, but perceptual learning is different. And perceptual learning is actually a learned behavior that yet affects us in a very deep way. And we're not the same after we experience perceptual learning. For instance, this uh, current, and you can be sure and go back and look these papers up. They're gonna delve a lot more than we'll do today. But if you look at the bone on the left, if you just look at it and you say, well, that's a leg bone, most people would say it's actually the femur. Um, yet a trained radiologist is going to immediately, within two to three seconds, focus on those lucent areas that are circled on the right. It's actually metastatic cancer spread throughout the bone. <clears throat> and then other studies will be done to confirm that. But to a trained eye that's been perceptually trained, he perceives immediately that this is cancer. And so that's, this is just an example of a visual perceptual learning perspective. What is perceptual learning? Well, Eleanor Gibson defined this years ago. It's long lasting, so it changes a person. They're not the same after they've experienced perceptual learning. It's perceptual, it changes the way we perceive things, and it is the result of learning, of practice and experience. So this is a recent study that I that really got me into thinking about this, uh, published in Current Biology, efficient learning in children with rapid GABA boosting during and after training. So basically, briefly, just to break this down, GABA is one of the neurotransmitters in our brain that's important in numerous synapses in helping us think, move, feel. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's a blocker, as opposed to some uh, glutamate and others who are more excitatory. And what it does, though, GABA is important in blocking sensory overload. For instance, if we're listening to a lecture and there's a siren down the street or there's some lights flashing from a fire alarm, then we would treat the siren and the fire alarm just as important as being just as important as the voice or the, the face talking to us. And GABA helps us pare down information into perspectives that we can actually absorb. <clears throat> Children experience learning and GABA is important in blocking sensory overload so that they can focus on what they need to learn to survive. Now, basically this study uh, talks, uh, the summary was that children indeed stabilize with GABA. They stabilize their uh, their their learning experiences with GABA that that had not been known or appreciated before this study. So children do experience perceptual learning in a powerful way. I'd written this paper year, several years ago about neuroplasticity. Now that's where our brain 
changes with learning, changes in a way that learning imprints us, it sculpts us, so to speak. And I wrote this paper about how neuroplasticity is important in the context of pornographic learning, how it can literally affect scripts, sexual scripts, sexual templates. Now, with that background, this is a fascinating study published years ago uh, by Morose and, and co-authors looking at the mirror neuron systems of the brain. Many years ago, there were some studies in primates that found that a monkey eating a peanut, sitting next to a monkey that was watching the monkey eat the peanut, they measured, they looked at individual areas of these primates' brains and found that mirror neuron systems essentially project the watching monkey that's watching the eating monkey into the eating monkey. So in his brain, there's a part of his brain that's eating the peanuts as well. And that not only wishes he was there, but that is actually perceptually experiencing it. So this study looked at individuals looking at, that were shown pornographic uh, clips. And there were these were functional MRI studies. And basically after they considered everything, they surmised in their summary that the mirror neuron systems prompts the observers, those observing individuals participating in sexual activity, to resonate with the motivational state of other individuals appearing in visual depictions of sexual interactions. So in other words, a mirror neuron system projects those watching into the film. Uh, and that's becoming even more robust neurologically with, with uh, 3D point with the uh, virtual reality pornography. Now, this Gail had quoted this in Pornland. Uh, Dr. Sun quoted this in her study, which I'm going to refer to in a minute about ejacula uh, facial ejaculation, and basically Bill Margold's statement that he intended to show violence against women through ejaculation on the face. This was uh, a planned, scripted, uh, desired outcome. So if we consider that learning mode, this study was done by Dr. Sun, Ezell, and Kendall <clears throat> out of NYU a number of years ago. And what she and her co-authors found was that contemporary mainstream pornography, this is ejaculation on the woman's face is a not just an aberrant uh, activity, but yet she found and other studies have confirmed that it's one of the most common. So this is sex. And so when a 12-year-old, 13-year-old boy or girl sees this, then the boy is learning, oh, well, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. The girl says, well, I guess this is what is supposed to happen here. Yet these, the men that were interviewed, and these were um, actually, uh, and I've got some of the quotes on the left. We're not going to take time to read these. Just note, though, uh, that these men that were interviewed, these are college educated males, all of them, 16 of them. And they're all saying, well, this is where we get the idea. This is where we learn what to do. It's all pornography. You can go back and look at this slide later, but essentially they're justifying it and saying pornography has taught us how to do this. Now I'd like you to consider what I've just said in the context of a study done years ago out of Canada. Took a rat, put the rat in a cage with a piece of wood soaked in cadaverine. Cadaverine is what makes dead animals uh, smell terribly. And so even rats hate cadaverine. It's unusual. Rats usually like anything that smells bad, not cadaverine. And so they put this male rat in the cage with cadaverine. The male rat did what a normal male rat would do when exposed to this substance and ran to the other side of the cage and began to paw the cage and try to escape. Next part, they took a female rat, took the took the cadaverine out, put a female rat in with the male rat to see if this rat was normal, and he mated with the female rat normally, as would be expected. Third part, they put the female rat back in the cage with the male rat, but they soaked her with cadaverine, her fur. At first, he tried to avoid her, but eventually his sexual drive took over and he mated with her. And every time the receptive, sexually receptive female was presented, to the male rat, she was soaked with cadaverine. So finally, the last part, they put the same male rat in the cage with the piece of cadaver, with the wood soaked cadaverine. And instead of running, now the male rat ran to the cadaverine, to the wood, and began to gnaw on the wood. So you have a perceptual learning experience with associative learning changing. 
and changing the way that this rat perceived sex. And the authors actually surmised and said an unconditionally uh, unconditionally aversive odor, cadaverine, was made less aversive and possibly conditionally appetitive by pairing with sexual reward. So you see where we're going with this. Uh, normally, a girl is not going to enjoy ejaculation on the face. We have a close relative. She's a professional now. When she was, she shared with my wife and I that when she was 14 years old, a 17 year old did exactly this to her. This was her first experience with anything sexual was this 17 year old ejaculating on her face and then rubbing the ejaculate on her face. She was 14 years old, had no idea what sex was. And yet now, of course, it makes sense to us, to her, to everyone, what was happening. Let's go on now and, uh, and talk about then what are the pornography cabals doing? They're not trying to stop it. Just as the tobacco companies uh, ignored copyright infringement with candy cigarettes, uh, the pornography pornography company the uh, pornographers of today don't try to either protect individual uh, young young ladies or young men for that for that matter. This is, of course, Lila Micklewhite from the um, some of the material with the Pornhub lawsuits, and we notice here that if you read this. They were trying to hide the minimum number of flags. There was only one person reviewing the flag. So this really wasn't, they weren't really trying to protect anyone here. Now, um, the UK originally uh, kind of stepped out in front with some protection bills. Um, and then in, we've had some success with some states. For instance, Pornhub blocked access in Virginia, Mississippi, and Utah uh, after uh some pr protective laws were, were placed. Really, the laws weren't trying to imprison uh, pornographers at this point. But if you notice the bottom of this slide, the power to sue, just collect damages civilly. That's really all they were going for at this point. And yet Pornhub withdrew because of that. Um, and the Free Speech Coalition, of course, fought this, the legal arm of the porn industry. Uh, a, a, a judge uh, supported the law and failed from from Pornhub standpoint, failed to to suspend the law and allowed it to continue, which was considered a setback for the free speech coalition and the pornography industry. Now, what do they say? What does the uh, pornography industry say? This is Mike Stabile. He's, um, I think, one of the director of public relations or uh, at the free speech coalition. And of course, he says, well, parents need to block and filter. So parents... Uh, should be more savvy than their internet savvy digital native children is their plan for that. That's really the pornography industry's plan is parents and others uh, supervise your sophisticated digitally native children and, and teenagers. And of course, that doesn't work. Uh, this study shows that that absolutely doesn't work and that we certainly need more now, I'm just going to run through some of these. I just like this analogy. It kind of stuck in my head. This is uh, this is one of the aqueducts running into Rome. It's 2,000 years old. Uh, it's the Aqua Virgo. Uh, it actually still delivers water to the Spanish steppes. We were in Pompeii, and as we were walking along, I noticed these this lead pipe. And so I started digging. A I had a deeper dive into lead pipes. They were throughout the Roman Empire, and it turns out that it probably resulted, helped to result in the fall of Rome. At least it contributed to declining birth rates uh, in Londinium, even all of the, the different um, areas of the, of the Roman Empire. They had lead pipes and high infant mortality rates throughout the, the Roman world because of this. So in a sense, we have lead in our pipes. We have lead in our internet for children. We're delivering knowledge to to children, to youth, um, and yet we have lead in the water. We have lead in the pipes, lead in the delivery systems of our internet. And it is damaging their templates. It's damaging their humanity. It's destroying their empathy. And yes, we do need to try to filter. Uh, and these are just different uh, filtering um, uh, resources. I think though that a public health approach to combat pornography, the cabals and their apologists 
that's really where we have to go. We're, we're get, we've had some success, civil and criminal, litigate and prosecute. The litigation has, I think, at least given them pause. But I think prosecution, you know, if you think about it, if someone has underage uh, pornographic uh, evidence of sexual exploitation, they're arrested. Then, you know, companies like Pornhub and others who have this material on their sites promoting it, um, I don't see why there's not more uh, criminal emphasis on this as well. But protect, filter, and communicate. Communication is important, of course. And then educate, emphasize connection, emotion, can immunize our young people against the objectification of pornography. I love this quote. It's Cicero. It's 2,000 years old. But he said, yet more if emotion be eliminated, what difference is there? I say not between a man and a brute, but between a man and a rock or the trunk of a tree or any inanimate object. And if we if we really lose our, our frontal executive control areas, our cortex, we become brainstems, uh, lizards, and we essentially don't even think or feel. In some ways, though, we become worse than lizards. At least lizards just go off dopamine and basic neurotransmitters that say survive. Unfortunately, as humans, we can turn our cortex and be even cruel and, and be even uh, exploitive. Things that even animals don't do. They're just trying to survive. You know, our brains are marvelous. I remember many years ago, uh, I was doing uh, what's called a colloid cyst on a friend. He was actually a, a, a fellow physician. And he called me. He, uh, they, they, they actually uh, purchased a new CAT scan machine for their practice. And he decided to be the guinea pig and try the machine out. Never do that. And so he jumped on the machine and he had this little marble sized tumor in the center of his brain and it's called a colloid cyst. And so he was in my office and he said, please tell me I can still go to the basketball game. I have final four tickets. And, and I said, I'm sorry, but, but you can't, I mean, this could, this could be fatal. So instead of him going, I was operating on this friend and to remove these, we basically have to go between the two halves of the brain. So I did what's called an inner, inner hemispheric approach, did a little craniotomy here and went split the two halves of the brain and went down and removed this colloid cyst. And fortunately, he did well. He was able to return to work as a physician. But I remember when I was there, because I knew this person, I'm looking at the fornix, which carries memory for, from half the brain, and I could see the basal ganglia and these areas that are really intimately involved in his emotion, his, who he is. And because I knew him, I thought he's there, <clears throat> this person that I know in these beautiful and delicate neural tissues, his essence is, is here, his humanity. And I thought, what, what a marvelous instrument the brain is. It, it can sense, it can feel, it can feel pleasure. It can feel pain. It can warn us but also it's so much more. It can love, it can have emotion, uh, it can have empathy and compassion. And I think that's who we are. I think that we're much better than the objectification that pornography has become today. And I think we can do better. Thank you.